my Nobel laureate in 1964, and then it's, it was always dedicated to combine research with the mission of building science and capacity building in the developing world. We are under tripartite, so we are under the Italian government, UNESCO, and IAEA. This means that our funds come from these three sources. What we do, as I already mentioned, we do research, education, and outreach. And as you see, by chance, we have here the picture of our new director that just started this week, as you know, so it's a very good picture to show it again. Uh, what we, which kind of research we do? Uh, I think we are almost uh, the only one UNESCO category one institute that really does research under the UNESCO umbrella. Uh, we, do, we do research in high energy, condensed matter, mathematics, applied physics, earth system physics, where I come from, and quantitative life science. We have several Nobel laureate connections uh, in ICDP, so there are several um, research at the CTP that has contributed to five Nobel Prize, and we divided our activity in all this, and I will be more specific later. So we try to support scientists in all stage of their career. So the red one below are the programs that are stable in ICTP. So the pro program that we have here, so people that are working here. The giant one are the one that we run here in collaboration with our partner institute and with, our, with, our, with other um, institutes all around the world. Uh, let's start with the uh, degree program. We do have a several degree program, PhD in several of our uh, specialty in collaboration with the university, with the UNESCO, and uh, with other universities around Italy and, and Europe, because uh, we need another institute to be able to grant the PhD because we, are, we cannot under the UNESCO umbrella. We are not entitled to do this. Then we have a very success, successful program that is a postgraduate diploma program. So what we do since 1991, we managed to bring over 1,000 diploma students and 70% of these managed to get PhD or they are working towards a PhD. What does this uh, program does? We pick up 10 students for each of, uh, of, the, of the research area we have and we try to um, uh, help them to get to, uh, to the market of the PhD for the Western country and for the, for the um, yeah, for Europe and the, um, the Western, uh, for the other Western country. And we do this because we realize that for them it's very tough coming from a developing country to access the PhD market. So it's one year intensive program in, uh, that we call master. Uh, so they get a little bit of everything in their field. And this is like the breakdown in the several fields we have per year. We see, you see that there are some programs like condensed matter and energy have been always there and also mathematics. Then we started the Earth System Physics. We started in uh, 2005 because we are a younger section and now this year also the other section started. Then uh, we, this is not the only program we have but it's one of the most successful ones. But then we have another program that allow us really to share and collaborate with the developing country. This is called the STEP program and this basically is a co-supervising program. So we co-supervise a student or enroll in a PhD program in our or his own country and then we allow the student to, to spend some time here in ICTP for the whole duration of the PhD and we co-share the supervision and the responsibility. This is quite a successful program as well and is mostly sponsored by the EIA. Uh, the Atomic Agency in Vienna. But we also are uh, prone to uh, encourage brain grain. So we try to uh, um, also work a lot in conference and workshop. So this is why we organize more than 60 conference and workshop like this every year. We have, been, we have been able to welcome up to 5,000 scientists from 145 nations each year and and attract this number of scientists through OSET activity. If you want like a map displacement of where all the scientists come from, this is the map in a glance since 1970. 
But we also have uh, uh, more applied opportunity for applied physics, uh, like for example, laboratory opportunity. We have an uh, uh, agreement with the, uh, the, with the Italian research laboratory and the nearby, like the Slovenia and the Austria, in which we try to enroll this student working with us in a program that is called TRAIL. So we are able to offer them a fellowship and to spend some time they need in the lab because maybe for their research they need a specific lab that is not available in their country. And so we look for that, in a, they look for that, and we help them to find what they need. And the another uh, scheme that is very successful, successful is the associate scheme. So we have the opportunity to work with our associates. So there, are, there is a number of associate schemes. So you have the senior, the young one, and the regular one, by which the uh, scientists work, working in developing country can apply and can ask to be our official associate. So they are entitled to visit ICTP in a time span of six years, and they can come every time, not longer than three months. And during this collaboration, we can share uh, we can work together, we can um, do uh, research together, but we hope that once they go back, they kind of uh, cult cultivate their own garden and try to be a source for us, for students and for uh, other future associates. Um, this, uh, this is something that is very successful and is uh, dedicated to more senior people. But also we have uh, uh, tradition of uh, long tradition of capacity building in developing country and in fact we do have an office of external activity that just take care of those things like how to collaborate with the with the institute abroad we have partner institute one in brazil one in china one in mexico and one in rwanda so they are really ictp little clone around the world but they um, it, it, they try to repeat i mean what we do here in their own country uh, then we have a program that is called Physics Without Frontier that goes really to uh, bring uh, the basic physics knowledge to some university that require, and then we have also a science dissemination unit. Now, summarizing this all in a glance, this is the map and this is all the place where ECTP is present, either with a, an affiliate center, with a network hub, scientific uh, workshop, school, and the Parton Institute, South America, Africa, China, and Central America. We do also have some more uh, senior program like the Salam Distinguished Lecture where we host every year uh, like a Nobel laureate or something like that to give us for a week lecture on a, on a topic of relevance. And then also we have some success story where our, for example, postgraduate post diploma student or associate made a career also thanks to ICTP. How does this translate for women uh, numbers? So thanks to all this program, we managed to have 18,000 visits from one, 170 countries, including 27 last developing, least developing countries. 22% of these are women, and 51% are from developing countries. This number is growing because we had 25% in 2018 and 20, 25% in the last five years. If we want to look again in a glance, which are the top 10 countries that are contributing women scientists to a CTP, this is the special displacement. And again, if we want to break down this per uh, region and per uh, research area, this is the breakdown. So you see this, there is a higher number in applied physics in almost all the nation that, it, that is followed by the her system physics and then it goes down when you go to the more uh, theoretical uh, field. Now going back to all the program I mentioned, so the step, the postgraduate, the trill and the associate, uh, this is the breakdown per country, per continent and, and this is what I want to highlight, the red number, is the percentage of women. As you can notice in this uh, uh, summary, as we know already, the famous, the famous scissor um, problem, in the, youngest, in the youngest stage of the career, so for step and postgraduate, we have usually the highest percentage. But then we, when we go to the associate program that is more for senior scientists, 
we start to see that the number is going down also uh, for our statistics. So we are perfectly in line with the world statistic. Uh, what, what else? We have also paying attention to awards. So these are all the awards given to women related to the ICTP. So we have uh, several uh, ICTP prize, uh, direct medal, Ramanujan, and the uh, ICO ICTP awards, and it's always put a particular attention to women to try to follow the Petra suggestion, like give awards to women, and that, like we are trying to do this. And then we also have to, we want to increase the number, the visibility of women for this colloquium, like we did uh, yes, the day before yesterday with this colloquium, and we always try to search for uh, very excellent and prominent women. What else we do? We do have, uh, we have started a website, so if you go on the ICTP website, there is always uh, um, a, web, a page dedicated to women in science in which you find the, the latest, uh, uh, the latest uh, news, what is going on related to women, which are the activity, which are the statistics, which are the useful information links and uh, pointing to uh, other activity around. And then, last but not least, we have a, a little of summary of what has been done since 2013 in CTP because we started to have a kind of, uh, not kind, a gender balance committee. So we started so to have a, a website, a biannual workshop for women in physics that Shobana will talk to you about that is very successful. We celebrate international events, like for example the International Day of Women and Girls, we have an administrative person to take care of the issue of family coming with children, and we also have a small budget to support now this and to encourage people, uh, family with children and women, but also men, to come around. We have uh, um, get ready, we got ready family rooms to, uh, to, uh, to be able to welcome family with children. There is a UNESCO gender focal point that at the moment is me, but I mean, uh, it can change, and also, one important thing that is unwritten policy to look at gender balance in whatever we do. So if we do the selection of diploma, PhD student, associate, we always look at the gender balance. If we organize a conference, we try to have at least one woman speaker among the, the invited speaker, if possible. And uh, in, every, in every other activity we do, we try to put a special, um, a special uh, weight on the gender balance. This is because uh, our like, uh, uh, going director was very keen on this, uh, so he was always very supportive of this initiative, uh, and hopefully we will keep doing this with the new director that we know that is uh, really very, um, very concerned about this issue. With this, I thank you, and I give the word to Tonya that will push on. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much, Erica, for giving me some time just to talk about uh, the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. Um, I don't have much time, but you can um, catch me in the coffee break and also come upstairs on the seventh floor if you need any more information about anything. We were also more or less founded by the same founder, Abdus Salam. Uh, it was his idea to host a conference here in 1987 because he realized that there weren't enough women in science, so he invited lots of women scientists to come here. They created a working group from that conference, and that was the beginning of OST. Uh, we are now growing at a, a very rapid rate. Um, I'm just going to take you through the main programs that we do so that you have an idea. I can't go into many details. Um, and I've tried to focus on the things that I think are most relevant to you here. Um, just briefly, you've all seen this diagram. I'm sure Scissors diagram totally reflects, for most countries, the situation for women coming into universities. So more women tend to come in at undergraduate level. As they go through their careers, they tend to drop off. This is often described as the pipeline, very often described as the leaky pipeline for women, and there are kind of pressure points where women will drop out, and it's really O's job to identify those places, try and find um, 
very good practices for encouraging women from specific, least developed and technologically lagging countries. So the poorest countries in the world in the belief that science can really uh, provide solutions to the main challenges that those countries face and that if women, as many women as possible, are included in designing and implementing those uh, um, challenges, the better the results will be. So the premise is the more women in science, the better the science. It's very important. It's not just about increasing numbers. It's about improving the science. Um, and we, we do this in these four different main areas. The one I'm going to focus on um, is networking, because, again, it's most relevant to all of you here. Second, just to let you know, and please come and find us up on the seventh floor afterwards to get more information, to let you know that we have a wonderful PhD and early career fellowship programs. Uh, we do many career development uh, training programs too, and we have prizes. Uh, the PhD fellowship program briefly is funded by Sweden. Uh, it focuses on women from 66 countries. Uh, the idea is to encourage mobility. So by definition, women in the poorest countries do not have enough resources. They need to leave their countries to do their PhDs. We provide that opportunity. We also give the possibility of a sandwich program, which means that they are based at their home institute and they can go up to three visits of at least six months each visit. Um, just to give you an idea uh, what the disciplines are from, we don't, we don't have any requirements for discipline except it's in STEM, all in STEM. And the women choose where they want to go and study. They must go and study in another developing country. It's a south-to-south -south program. This uh, has been proven to um, assist, uh, the, to counteract brain drain for many different reasons, which I can't go into now. Um, but here you can see, I don't know how this compares with all of your figures, but it's not such a bad number, for example, 9% here uh, of all of our women in, are in physics. Um, chemical science is 14%. That's quite a good number, I think. We always have most of our applications and awards in agricultural sciences, not surprisingly, over 30%. Uh, engineering science is there, 18%. Computing, only 5%. Astronomy, space and earth sciences, 4%. You may notice that there is no maths at all this year. Um, sorry, the yellow is biological systems and organisms, and it's 9%. Um, but we also have... Uh, yeah, that's very low this year. Usually we have much higher numbers in, in biology. But mathematics is definitely, definitely an issue for us, and we're trying to work with ICTP and the maths department at ICTP and with the... Um, the International Mathematics Union to try and work out exactly what's going on there. And um, what we find is that most of the women who apply in maths are really working in mathematical modelling, and that tends to be interdisciplinary. And, um, and what, what, what our ICTP scientists are very disappointed is not to find any what they call real mathematicians, like pure mathematicians. And um, Again, that's another argument about the basic sciences and their relevance to development as well. And you'll find uh, very interesting arguments made by ICTP about that. Um, by nationality, just to give you an idea of what, how it looks this year, most of our applicants come from Africa, at least 50%, and most of them will go to institutes in South Africa, which have excellent uh, institutes. In Asia, for example, we get a lot of applications from Bangladesh and Myanmar, and they will tend to go and study in Malaysia. Uh, we have very few applications from Arab countries. We only have three eligible countries. Uh, but Sudan has exceptional women scientists, particularly for whatever reason, and I would love you to do some research on this in physics. Don't know why, but extremely good women scientists from Sudan in physics. We can't give all of the awards we want to give to them. Um, you can have a look at this more closely, you'll have a copy, you can see the eligible countries. But you can see that we only have very few in the Arab region. Djibouti, Palestine only added last year. Sudan, Syrian Arab Republic only added last year. Yemen, we also have a very good record, um, a surprisingly good record with Yemeni uh, graduates. Over 260 fellows have graduated. I think that number has now gone up to 270 because we've just managed to get on board some of our... Uh, older uh, uh, PhD uh, fellows. 
Um, we have a newsletter that comes out uh, four times a year with lots of stories of success stories. Um, and this is a young woman from Bhutan who went to study in India and she's working on issues of climate change, hydropower development and water resource management on ecology and the environment in Bhutan. Um, just to give you an idea of her working environment, I thought that was a lovely picture. Just to, <laughs> She's going out in the field. These are the challenges that women face. She has to find ways of uh, communicating and working with uh, a group of, of, of male farmers uh, in the countryside. That's quite typical. Uh, this is a brand new fellowship program uh, and it's very prestigious. It's funded by Canada, the Ita uh, International Development Research Centre. This again was a, a joint kind of proposal between IDRC and OSD where we identified what's really needed. So a big problem is for women who have their PhDs who by definition, as we said before, have had to leave their countries to get the expertise, but they do want to go home. They do return home. When they get home, no resources, no contacts, lots of teaching will coincide with their family requirements. Um, they're back where they started in some ways, and that's a crucial moment where they will drop out of that pipeline. So we've created this amazing fellowship, high-level fellowship, to allow women to stay at home in these under-resourced countries to build up uh, laboratories, build up equipment, to invite international scholars to come and talk, for them to go and visit other countries if they need to. Uh, they, it's a very flexible grant. If they need to spend a lot of that money on childcare assistance, they can do that. The important thing is that they are enabling themselves to continue with their research at a high level and maintain that uh, so crucial network. Um, We've had our second cohort of 20 fellows just uh, selected and we're doing a workshop in Tanzania in two weeks' time. Uh, there's a big focus on linking with industry, which was a requirement of the Canadian funding, uh, to try and make that research sustainable, to try and encourage researchers to, to, to find ways of supporting their research afterwards. Uh, again, this is not easy to do. Many researchers don't know how to do transference to industry. Uh, and we are exploring this and running new training programs around this. And I'd love to talk to anybody who has some ideas about how we might do that more effectively. Um, sorry, I'm going to run through this. This is our wonderful awards program. Um, the impact of our awards program, just to say briefly, we have five awards each year. This uh, young woman from Bolivia uh, received her award at, during the uh, American Association uh, for Science uh, Conference, where there are thousands of delegates, um, and they give a presentation on their research. Uh, we visited the embassy, the Bolivian embassy in Washington with her. As a consequence, uh, she was on the front page of the Bolivian newspaper, the Prime Minister of Bolivia, Eva Morales invited her to come and visit him. And as a direct consequence, there will now be the first uh, uh, International Day of Women in Science in Bolivia on February next year. Um, so th this is what I think you'll mostly be interested in because it's, it's most relevant to all of you. We have this membership program. Now, the great thing about the membership program is it's not a selection it's not an elite organization. This is any woman from a developing world who has at least a postgraduate degree in a science subject, including social science. Um, you can go on our website, you can click become a member, and you, you, need to just, you need to have ready your PhD certificate or your master's certificate to upload, and, and it will come into our uh, into our office upstairs and, and it will get approved if everything is, is correct in terms of, it's just about eligibility. Uh, we have over 8,800 members um, and you can see in all of these different countries. Um, and uh, you can go on our website and you can see uh, for each country who the members are um, and what their, what their discipline is. If there are more than 20 members in any country, they can set up a national chapter and I think I'm going to have to <laughs> finish here. But um, you can catch me during the coffee break. And also, Fiona, Fiona, can you stand up? Fiona works in the office upstairs uh, on specifically on the membership and national chapters. And she would love to talk to any of you who are interested. Thank you.
Um, Erica and Tanya, thank you so much. Um, there's a lot of information. Um, I think if you wish to engage, please do so over coffee. Um, it's a delight to tell you a little more about Shobana Narasimhan, who um, you have been talking to, probably.